I was a professor of history uh, at Columbia College in South Carolina for about 20 years, but a few years ago I decided to do something different, so I'm currently teaching eighth graders, uh, which is different. Uh, I'll ask my colleagues if they will introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Miriam Amar Sadegi. I run a nonprofit organization that provides civic education to people living in Iran. That's where I'm originally from and came to the U.S. when I was uh, seven years old. Uh, was a participant in the We the People program the first year it was offered and it was really transformative for me. So I'm really proud and uh, happy to be with you. Good afternoon, I'm Barry Anderson, an Associate Justice on the Minnesota Supreme Court. Um, I actually uh, have judged this competition over the last several years, but I also had the experience of serving as an assistant coach. So I've been a, not on your side of the table, I've been out there watching your side of the table. And I know some of uh, the work that you put in and the stress you're under. And we're just delighted you're here and looking forward to a conversation. And would you introduce yourselves, please? My name is Shailen Nash. I'm Adrian Peterson. I am Madison Kreider, and our wonderful teacher is Miss Amy Galloway. Hi. Indeed. Very good. Well, we are interested in the philosophical and historical foundations of the American political system, and we're going to ask you question two. Our system of government is based on both natural rights philosophy and classical republicanism. Which philosophy, if any, has predominated American political thought? And what have been the benefits and costs of this predominance? What examples of contemporary issues can you describe that reflect the tensions between classical Republican ideas and those of natural rights philosophy? What position would you take on which of the philosophies, if either, should prevail? Explain what principles and values underlie your position. Please begin. And for support of this declaration, with the firm alliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, the Declaration of Independence. Our founders relied heavily on natural rights and classical republicanism philosophy. Although they depend on many of the writings of Aristotle and the ideals of classical republicanism, such as civic virtue, demonstrated by the sacrifice of the Revolutionary War, our nation strongly reflects natural rights philosophy in almost every aspect of life. As Abigail Adams said to her husband, if particular care and attention is not paid to ladies, we are determined to form a rebellion, and we will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. This emphasizes natural rights philosophy, popular sovereignty, and un unable rights that have led to a butterfly reflex resulting in social and political movements that have changed the nation. John Locke introduced the social contract idea that every person is born with the rights of life, liberty, and property. And the purpose of government is to protect those rights. This corresponds with Jefferson's belief of the inalienable rights mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The benefit of focusing on natural rights is a limited government that protects people's rights and is administered through popular sovereignty. The First Amendment is a quintessential example of individuals using their liberty to promote equality and limit power as seen through the civil rights movement led by Dr. King. But this was successful because of individuals fighting for their rights through sit-ins and marches, a form of expression. The cost of focusing on rights is the degradation of community into selfish interests contributing to increased violence. These issues intersect with the rise of mass shootings and the recent suicides of Parkland survivors and a Newton father. According to the Cato Institute, in 1984, there were 22 deaths due to mass shootings, in, while in 2017, there was a historical high of 117 deaths. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, suicide is now the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. Balancing individual rights with the common good doesn't just have costs and benefits, it leads to tension and can devolve into character assassination. With the rise in mass shootings has renewed the gun control debate. While the Second Amendment protects an individual's rights to bear arms, no rights are infinite, and I think common sense gun reform should be implemented. The Renewed Violence Against Women Act include bearing gun ownership for those convicted of misdemeanor gun, domestic violence or stalking. The NRA has vowed to block this. NRA spokeswoman Jennifer Baker said, The new provisions are too low of a threshold to deny someone a constitutional right for the rest of their life. Alaska has the highest number of gun deaths per capita in the 50 states, and we are ranked fifth with the number of crime deaths reported. Yet, we also have some of the, lo the loosest gun laws in the nation. We do not require a license or a waiting period. Similar issues include church and state conflicts seen in the struggles over same-sex marriage and the teaching of creation science in schools, which have banned with the case of Edwards and Gillard in 1987, ruling the teaching of creationism violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment because the law was specifically intended to advance a particular religion. We believe natural rights philosophy should prevail because each individual rights are equal. 
Political equality and equal protection of the law ensures the protection of minority rights in a majority rule nation. However, an increasing selfishness and lack of civic discourse are dividing us. We must return to the Founders' vision. They pledged their lives and their mutual honor for the cause of liberty. We must become who we are destined to be instead of who we have become, a nation of individuals unable to speak to each other. As Aristotle stated, every state is a community of some kind, and every community is established with a view of some good. For mankind always act in order to obtain which they think good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you raised a lot of interesting and important, indeed vital issues, so let's explore those a bit, a bit further, if you will. Uh, let's think about education for a little bit. Uh, is it the purpose of education primarily, I know it can go both ways, primarily to inculcate civic virtue so that you will become better citizens, so that you will continue the traditions that we've talked about and learned about here? Or is it the purpose of education primarily to, uh, to make you more free? A liberal education is a liberal, an education for free people, and an educated person is more free. Is it primarily the purpose of education to make you free, or to make you responsible and virtuous? What would you say? I believe that um, both your subjects were are true, and they both are equally valid. But which is going to predominate? I don't think either will predominate. Considering that. In oh the come school. on! Bear with me here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they will both predominate but equally because they have to work together. In the US schools, we, uh, we promote an independent thought so we can have a greater innovative society. But through that innovation, we also hope that we will continue to expand our values, keep them, and perhaps even make better values from them. So I can't provoke you to make to take a stand on one side or the other? Because education makes you stronger, and being a strong person equals being a stronger citizen for the country. So the you, you began your statement with the Declaration of Independence, you, you uh, finished your statement with the Declaration of Independence, and Jefferson uses a phrase in that declaration, I guess I should be careful about attributing it to him because the committee worked it over pretty well, but, but let's uh, bear with me here for a moment. He uses the phrase pursuit of happiness, um, seems to be kind of an unusual phrase. Is that a reflection of classical republicanism or is that a reflection of natural rights, both, neither, what do you think? Um, I believe that it goes under natural rights because uh, happiness is defined by the individual um, and with limited government, the government can't define what is happiness to them. Um, but I do believe it has a certain uh, end, ending point, like there's a line to it, um, which also goes under the social contract because some rights of the people needs to be taken away um, in order to have a more uh, better <laughs> society, yes. Okay, um, so as a society, we are increasingly online. Uh, social media is a growing part of our life. It's already a huge part of our life. It looks like it's gonna become bigger and bigger. Is it helping civic virtue? Is it helping the common good? Is it helping our sense of civic responsibility, of oneness as a nation, or is it harming all those things? Presently, I would say that it would view that, or it would appear so it is harming it, yet the possibilities for it to be more helpful if the media, in a way, kind of controls itself through popular sovereignty or just through civic virtue or a combination of both, where we become less hostile towards each other and less needing to be with a group of people and focus more on individual thought and promoting what we think is best for our nation, not as secular or factional groups, but as individuals promoting our beliefs along with the beliefs of those that founded the country. I would have to agree to disagree with my colleague because I believe uh, social media, uh, I, I do agree with the fact that it can have it has its uh, negatives and positives, but I do believe that uh, with media and other internet forums, um, it can help people access information that they may not get in school 
or uh, just on a daily basis uh, through maybe like uh, certain news that they watch as well. Um, personally, uh, uh, with social media, it does help me be informed. It does make me want to contribute more to civic virtue and to make my society better. I agree with my colleague too because with civic virtue you can um, with online you can understand more diverse places in the world with the you, you someone can be more prejudiced about something and they can um, with online sort of research they can actually learn what the culture is about. You mentioned other places in the world. I'm wondering if there are other places in the world that have experienced, they might not call it classical republicanism, they might not call it natural rights, but I wonder if there are other places we can look to that have uh, dealt with classical republicanism or uh, natural rights and have had either positive or negative experiences. Is there anything you can point to, foreign experiences? I think it's easy to point out to the Magna Carta established in Britain, of course, as not only just the people, but the parliament itself saw the king as being dictatorial, tyrannical, um, and overstepping the boundaries, even what they would have considered to be someone of a divine um, influence to do. They thought that uh, despite having this divine power of authority um, as given through in their preceded culture and history being that the king was one step below God, at least after the separation of the Catholic Church, they thought that even though that person held that sort of power, that it was unfair for one person to have so much control and that there should be a check in case perhaps that person be satanic. All right, we'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs> This is a tough argument. It seems obvious. Well, they just balance, and we go, but but indeed they don't. And you pointed that out that you know, we have privileged uh, natural rights, particularly in the, in the 19th, 20th century. And yet we've seen times when we need to focus more on building civic virtue. Uh, and so this is a, con a continual interplay of values, both of which, all of which, are important to us. Uh, and I think you reflected that this uh, quite well. Our discussion was fruitful enjoyable. I'm very glad you came all this way just to talk to us. So uh, I uh, found your statement really uh, interesting. I appreciated the reference to Abigail Adams. Uh, for someone who never held an elective office, she was a uh, major influencer on uh, events of the uh, late 1700s and early 1800s. Um, I, I thought you set up well this question of, you know, you can have either, can you have both, can you have both at the same time? Um, we really do need both. So if you don't have uh, civic virtue, uh, well, how are your natural rights going to be vindicated? Um, and if you have too much civic virtue, um, if you have too much classical republicanism, it may be that it interferes with your natural rights. Uh, so, uh, you know, I thought it was well done and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. I like that. I like the naturalness of your answers. I like that as a team you were not afraid to disagree and bring out the the fullness of a response on, on, on my question about uh, social media. I think that you balanced each other out really well. I uh, really enjoyed listening to you. You should be so proud that you have immersed yourself in this material that is very important. It's going to stay with you for the rest of your life, believe me. It might not seem like it today, <laughs> but there'll be, compared to other things you learn, uh, this stuff is really important. It's going to hang around. Thank you so much.